So I know we're here early. I hope everybody's enjoying the conference. Day two, welcome. Uh, we're going to kick it off here. Uh, I always appreciate a little bit of fan interaction this early in the morning, so I'm going to start off with a few questions, some show of hands. Um, how many of you here have ongoing Gen AI initiatives within your business? Can I see some hands? Okay, so about that. M most everybody. Awesome. Now, the crucial question, how many of those initiatives have resulted in production deployments? Okay, so not as many as the first group, so probably about half. And that's really what we want to address today. So my name's Corey Smith. I'm a senior security consultant with the Gen AI Innovation Center at AWS. And I have the privilege to work with customers on a daily basis to build, secure, scale, and deploy Gen AI workloads to production. And what I most often hear from customers as a blocker on the path to production is uncertainty around security. They just feel like there's a lot of unknowns. So what we want to do today is highlight the use of bedrock, bedrock guardrails, to provide a level of certainty and assurance around moving workloads to production. So that's going to consist of just a really quick overview of bedrock, bedrock guardrails, and then we're going to talk about how you can configure, deploy, and most crucially, test guardrails before moving to production. Um, so before we get going, uh, I'll move to the next slide and cover bedrock, uh, Amazon Bedrock. So if you're not familiar with Amazon Bedrock, it's a fully managed service which allows you to build and deploy generative AI workloads at scale without having to manage any underlying infrastructure. You have access to several models from leading model providers, which enables you to choose and test the model that fits best for your use case, depending on text to text, text to speech, um, image to image, whatever, whatever the use case is, uh, there's a number of models for you to test it and select. Once you've selected a model, you can then customize that model further through continuous pre-training and fine-tuning approaches, making it work more specific to your use case uh, as needed. With retrieval augmented generation through bedrock knowledge bases, you can incorporate your corpus of knowledge sources across your enterprise to provide context-aware results and uh, further enhance prompts to uh, provide better accuracy for your users. If you're familiar with AI agents and multi-agent collaboration, that allows you to build and deploy and execute multi-step workflows with reasoning built in. So intelligent decision-making on which path to take uh, is, is really important there. And of course, it's a security conference. All of this is built on a foundation of security, privacy, and safety. So for this talk, before we introduce Bedrock Guardrails, what's important to understand about Amazon Bedrock is that it allows us to prompt a model and receive a response. That's the crucial element for this presentation. Looking at Bedrock Guardrails, a, a native security control within the service, this is how we secure that prompt response process. So Bedrock Guardrails consists of a number of configurable, configurable security policies, and the guardrail simply references the collection of policies that you've configured. And Bedrock guardrails can be applied to models within Amazon Bedrock, uh, agents, Bedrock workflows, and most interestingly, with the release of the Bedrock guardrail apply guardrail API as a standalone API, you can now use Bedrock guardrails to secure the prompt response process for models not hosted in Bedrock. So you can invoke guardrail evaluations um, independently without having to use a Bedrock model. Um, most importantly is the use of um, the individual specific policies within guardrails. Um, I'll cover the brief flow here. So guardrails can be configured to evaluate inputs and outputs or both. And depending on which element violates the security policy um, depends on the action that's taken. And of course, this is all pre-configured by you. So if it's the user input that violates the policy, say a user asks about a denied topic, uh, you've got a banking app and they're asking about healthcare, you want to return a pre-configured block message which says you're violating the acceptable use of this uh, chatbot and maybe recommend some pre-approved pre queries that can get them started on their journey to effectively using the chat experience. If it's the foundation model output that violates the security control, you've got one of two options. The first is to return that pre-configured block message saying they're asking about something they shouldn't or they're using language they shouldn't. Maybe it's profanity, maybe it's cursing. There's a number of things that we'll get into in the next few slides that you can configure. But it, if it violates, you can return the pre-configured block message. The other option, if it's sensitive data discovery or detection, sensitive data detection, 
or they're using words or phrases that you've specifically blocked in the chat experience, you can simply mask that, provide the answer, uh, by simp but redacting the known elements of PII or any form of regulated data. Uh, and that's all pre-configured pre and tuned through the model, uh, through the guardrail for you. If there's no guardrail interventions, and what the user asks is approved and the response is approved, then the response simply flows to the user without any form of modification, no redaction, no masking, and no blocked message. So it would work as expected. One of the first places that we tell people to start is with denied topics. So I mentioned the guardrail is simply the collection of security policies. The first security policy we want to look at is the denied topic. And we often say, when, def when defining your strategy for bedrock guardrails, the first thing you need to do is define your use case. Because once you've defined your use case, you can really quickly define what people shouldn't be asking about. So I gave the example of a banking application. In this, we simply don't want it to give any form of investment advice. So we create one denied topic around investment advice. Using natural language, we specify what the user shouldn't be able to discuss or prompt from the model. And then we provide a few canned examples. Uh, if you're familiar with few shot prompting and giving some examples in order to make the model response more performant, very similar concept here. By providing a few example phrases, the guardrail actually learns and determines what it should and shouldn't respond to. So you don't have to provide an exhaustive list. You just need a few high quality examples of what shouldn't be allowed from the chatbot. And you can configure a number of denied, pol denied topic policies within one guardrail. Moving on to content filters, so an exhaustive list here, hate, insult, sexual violence, prompt attacks, misconduct. There's a number of individual components within the content filter policy that you can enable. You can enable one, all, none, and you can also individually tune the sensitivity to low, medium, and high. And what that represents is a confidence rate of the guardrail evaluation. So when the input comes in, if you've got the prompt attack uh, guardrail conf or policy configured, and there's a high confidence, but you don't have the high set, then you won't block it. So when we get into the testing framework, which, which Vic will be talking about here in a second, is how we want to test and evaluate guardrails to get the optimal configurations for the sensitivities of these content filters. Uh, looking at word filters, so after we've identified our use case, we might want to restrict certain things that people can say. Uh, number one is a managed profanity list by Amazon. So it's a world recognized list of profane words. Um, you also have the ability to create custom word lists and phrase lists. So if you don't want customers asking about competitors in your chatbot, you can create words and phrases specific to the competitor that you don't want them to ask. And similar to what we talked about before, if they do that, you can either mask those words or you can return a pre-configured block message saying that they shouldn't be using that language or, uh, again, recommend pre-approved queries to get them started in the chat experience. Sensitive information filters, everybody here I assume is familiar with PII and the various forms that PII can take, both in healthcare, banking, finance. Um, and with, this, with the sensitive information filters, you can redact uh, PII entities that are recognized in US, UK, and Canada. It's continuously evolving. Uh, but also of note is you can create custom regex filters for detections and indicators specific to you. So if your use case has something that's not on the list of pre-configured PII entities, you can configure that through regex and uh, receive the same response. So before I hand off to Vic to talk about how we can test and iterate, I just want to cover the best practices for bedrock guardrails. So now that we know what they are, we know what you can do in them, what's the approach that you should take, take starting today to secure your production workloads tomorrow? Number one I mentioned already, define the use case. So if you are doing a banking uh, chatbot and you want to expose that to your customers on the website, you need to understand what the inputs and outputs are, how those inputs will be gathered and how the outputs will be served, and from there, you can start to create your denied topics, your word and phrase list that you want to restrict, and turn on the specific PII detections that you need for your use case. Once we understand the use case and we understand how the input will be gathered and the model responses will be served, uh, we understand that prompt response process. We want to create our guardrail strategy. The guardrail strategy, I like to say, is a day zero activity. When you are designing a solution, you should be thinking about your guardrails. Um, Vic will use an analogy to WAF, which I think serves us really well. 
you don't want to turn on a guardrail when you move to production. You should understand how the guardrail has been built, how it's been tested, how it's been validated, and you want to do this throughout the SDLC so that you know how the guardrail configurations will impact your application. You simply do not want to slap it on uh, when you go to production. So once we've defined our guardrail strategy, the next step is to configure the, the word list, the block list, the denied topics, and test. There are, sorry, I get a bit sweaty. Um, there are a number of configurations in the guardrail that we've just covered. And what is optimal to you is going to be very specific to your use case. So we encourage an iterative approach to designing the security policies within the guardrail. And that requires a testing framework so that you can fire prompt test cases at your guardrail and validate that you're getting the expected results. When you start to get results that aren't exactly what you anticipated, that's where you want to tune the denied topics, the sensitivities within the content filters, and maybe turn on higher thresholds for things like profanity or hate or all these things that you might have within your security policies. Once we have a guardrail that we believe to be tested and fit for purpose for our use case, we want to move on to enforcing that guardrail through policy. So I presume everybody's familiar with identity and access management policies and your ability to use conditional statements within them. When you're building the IAM policies for your use case and you have solutions invoking bedrock on AWS, you can use conditional statements to enforce the use of specific guardrail versions, which is why it's important to version guardrails. And you can ensure that highly high quality tested guardrails are being used for your solution. And that's all done through identity and access management conditional statements. So once we've got the guardrail built, we've got it tested, we're enforcing its use across our enterprise or across the solution, we want to move into a monitor mode. And the nice thing about bedrock guardrails is there's a number of CloudWatch metrics that are emitted from the service. Most importantly for me is the guardrail interventions. So you can identify when a guardrail is intervened, how it intervened, and why it intervened. And you can also use these data points to further tune your guardrails. So if you're getting a number of in interventions, it might be an opportunity to go investigate malicious use of your app. Of your app. Um, and then bringing this full circle, as we're monitoring, we're understanding all these data points, we want to continuously reevaluate our use case. Are we seeing interventions because of prompts we didn't expect? If we are, should our use case allow for those prompts? Do we need to change the denied topics or the examples within them? Do we need to change the word and phrase lists? How do we continuously evaluate and iterate our guardrail solution to ensure that we're continually fit for purpose? So this is the overview of how you uh, go from A to Z of guardrails. Um, next, we're going to highlight the specific iteration and testing to make sure that your guardrails are fit for purpose. So I'm going to pass it to Vic. So thanks, Corey. So before we dive in, into the need for automated testing, I want you to think of a web application rule, web application firewall rule that you have created and have applied that on your web application, but it is not tested. Now you look at the configuration of the rule, you know how it's going to work. But until and unless you test it with the live traffic or live like traffic, you, you, there is no certainty how it's going to behave. It is the exact same case with the guardrails as well. You create a guardrail, you apply that on your Gen AI workload, and if it is not tested, it could be too permissive, meaning it could allow a lot of malicious prompts to come in, and it might cause business risks. If it is too restrictive, then it might cause business interruption on your Gen AI applications. So what we recommend is, at, identifying the edge cases for your guardrails and creating the prompts for it and do, doing a lot of testing. So what we have seen working with our customers is there's a lot of challenge in testing these guardrails with prompts. So you're not testing 10 prompts, you're testing hundreds of prompts against a set of guardrails. So when we work with our customers, we always recommend creating a automation framework where they can automate the testing of guardrails with hundreds of prompts, visualize the results and analyze them and understand where they can fine tune their guardrails. So next we are gonna dive deep into the reference architecture that you can use to build your own uh, evaluation framework. So this is the evaluation uh, reference architecture for guardrail testing. It is completely serverless, uses S3 buckets, Lambda functions, SQS queues, Amazon Bedrock, and QuickSight dashboard. So what you see here on the left hand side is a prompt configuration file. It's going to contain 
all the prompts and the guardrails that you want to test those prompts against. So in this case, we just have three prompts and two guardrails. In the real case, you may have hundreds of prompts and tens of guardrails. So once this file is uploaded to this S3 bucket, this S3 bucket has, uh, has been configured with the object lambda. So the moment it is uploaded here, it triggers this message generator lambda function. So what this lambda function does is, it fetches this prompt configuration file, matches, maps each and every prompt to each and every guardrail. And that's what you see here in the generated messages box. So each prompt is mapped to each guardrail. So there are about like six messages here. And each, messages, and each message is sent to the Amazon SQS queue. This SQS queue is FIFO in nature, which is first in, first out. So when the message M1 gets to the SQS queue, the Lambda function, guardrail evaluator Lambda function, picks it up. And then it calls the apply guardrails API on Amazon Bedrock. So what apply guardrails API does is, it takes the prompt, takes the guardrail, runs the prompt against the guardrail, and provides us with the evaluation results. Those evaluation results are, uh, analyzed by the Lambda function here and stored in the S3 buckets. Once all of these messages are processed, they are stored in this S3 bucket and visualized through QuickSight here. So before we take a look at the QuickSight dashboard and the final results, let's look at the guardrail that we are testing here. So we have a FinOps guardrail. This, uh, this guardrail we have created for a finance chatbot. We have configured all the filters here, sexual violence, hate, insults, misconduct, prompt attack, and set the strength to high. We have configured the profanity uh, here. So this is the AWS managed list of profanity words. If there are any words which match this criteria, they get blocked. And then we have configured a topic for text advice. It's a fin fin FinOps chatbot. It shouldn't be advising you on how, how can you claim deductions on your tax. So we, this is one of the topics that we have uh, configured as a denied topic. And then there are different PII configs as well, like address, age, email address, IP, name. So the FinOps chatbot really has no use case of processing all of this PII, because it is just providing you with advice how you can invest money. It doesn't need all of this PII. So next, we are going to look at some prompts that we are going to run against this guardrail. So on the top, we have some healthcare guardrails. Then we have some finance guardrails. And then we have some, uh, sorry, we have some healthcare prompts, finance prompts, and then we have some PII prompts. I want you to focus on PHI4. So basically, this prompt says is, this is my social security number. Provide me with my latest health records. Now let's see how our guardrails work. So this is the screenshot of the QuickSight dashboard. We are visualizing all the results from uh, the analysis that we did. This is a very wide screenshot. That's why it has been divided into two parts here. So the first column is job name, which is we have named it as first run because this is the first iteration of the prompts that we ran through the guardrails. Source is input, because these are the input prompts to the model. So I want you to focus on this prompt ID PHI4, and you ran this against the two guardrails, FinOps guardrail and healthcare guardrail. So what we can see here is there is none, no action taken by both the guardrails. Now this is expected for a healthcare chatbot, because it's a legitimate use case, because you want to have healthcare chatbot answer the questions related to your health records, but it is not a legitimate use case for a FinOps guardrail. So here we see that it was not blocked. Next, what we do is we fine tune the guardrail. Now we have identified that there is a problem with the guardrail. We need to fix it. So we go here in the guardrail configuration and we add a healthcare topic. Basically what it says is, do not provide any information related to healthcare, disease diagnosis, medical records, and then we have provided some samples so Bedrock can learn from it, or Bedrock guardrails can learn from it. And then in the PII config, we have also configured US social security number. With these configurations in, let's see how the evaluation takes place. Now, in the second run, what we are seeing is there is no impact on the healthcare guardrail. There's still action as none, because we did not update this guardrail. But we did update the FinOps guardrail here, and it has intervened on two accounts. So it has detected the US social security number, and then it has also detected the healthcare topic, and the topic type is denied. So it has blocked this prompt on two accounts. So the prompts are evaluated holistically. They are not evaluated just for the action or just for the topic. It matches all the different criteria that you have specified within the guardrail configuration. So this was a very simple uh, demonstration of what is possible when it comes to fine tuning your guardrails. Next, I would like to thank every one of you to take your time out and attend our talk. I would request all of you to complete your session survey in your uh, AWS event Thank you.